hi guys I'm back it's uh, Friday afternoon and uh, I'm still kind of worn out from the last videos I've made I'm making videos for two classes and it's it's quite the challenge but uh, I'm here for you so let's let's do it now uh, I'm not gonna uh, spend a lot of time warming up like or, or giving you uh, background information regarding the class by now everybody should know how to do it if, if you don't for heaven's sake get a hold of me uh, read the syllabus figure out what um, there might be confusing to you and email me with questions because uh, we got to move we got to move um, okay so today's going to be Leo Steinberg, and I'll try to talk about him for an hour. The last video I made went over two hours. It was crazy, so uh, that was a lot for me to expect of myself and a lot uh, for me to expect of you guys. That You know, reading takes long enough, and then although we don't meet in class, uh, it does take a while to watch these videos, so I, I try to break them down into smaller increments because it's easier for me to handle and also that sort of breaks up your task for you so that'll probably happen again t today uh, but I'll, I'll do my best to, to keep it somewhat short and sweet so without further ado uh, we'll look at Leo Steinberg uh, contemporary art in the plight of its public 1962 now uh, this should have been more uh, congenial for you to read uh, for a number of reasons than some of the other pieces. Uh, you know, if you think about a lot of what we've, what little we've read this semester, it's quite difficult because it's being aimed specifically at an academic audience. Uh, not really intended for the general reading public, though, when you get to the Steinberg piece. You know, he's written this for, I believe, uh, The Atlantic, you know? I mean, it's not an erudite, learned publication meant for a very specialized reader. It's meant for, uh, you know, somebody who's got some kind of an education, but uh, not on any particular special topic. And, you know, the pieces that appear there are going to be smart and, and research, but, you know, it, it's a popular periodical. So Steinberg's writing for that. Um, and he's going to be writing about modern art as he's experiencing it in his own day. You know, just for the record, Steinberg, uh, who was a beloved instructor for many, many years in New York City. Uh, his primary era, area of scholarship was actually Renaissance painting. He, he, he wrote a couple of books, one of which is uh, quite notorious, uh, caused a lot of controversy uh, on, on Renaissance painting. Uh, and on weekends, he would go out to see modern art just as, as a break from his uh, work uh, with paintings and statues dating back hundreds of years. Uh, so he's doing this kind of as an advocation, and yet he gains enough traction with his work that uh, he's actually now best known for uh, the work that he actually did merely as a hobby, and uh, although he's certainly known uh, as a, a Renaissance scholar, too. Uh, I, I think that his uh, sideline, his hobby, I wouldn't call it a side hustle, but his sideline actually uh, eclipsed his primary researches. In any case, he, in the process of going to review shows, becomes a bit of a man about town, and he gets to know quite a number of other critics, which he would have been, uh, and famous artists, and he's going to begin this article on the plight of the public, conveying some of their 
opinions about uh, the public, and it, it's it's pretty clear at the beginning of the article that uh, these people running around in uh, elite uh, groups uh, really don't have much interest or consideration at all in the public and uh, modern art was understood to be sufficiently difficult and uh, sufficiently wild, uh, especially in the uh, decade just before that uh, Steinberg is writing this piece, sufficiently wild that nobody could ever appreciate it except for a, a informed, intelligent, and courageous few. But uh, uh, if the public didn't get it, well, who cares? You know, they're, they're not worth worrying about art. Uh, as uh, one of these people that Steinberg uh, speaks with will say is, uh, wh why should we care? Our art's not for everybody anyway. You know, it's, it's no concern of mine if these people don't get it, which I'll, I'll get into later. But for now, again, we've got this set of the, the elite few who do get it, and the public is just not, not to be uh, taken into account. Uh, but to start to challenge these dominant ideas that uh, art, especially modern art, is only for the privileged, informed, and courageous few, uh, to challenge this notion, Steinberg is going to uh, trace a very, very brief history of modern painting, beginning around the turn of the last century and uh, see if, if this doesn't actually modify this elitist outlook of ours. Uh, so he, he talks about Matisse, the famous French painter, uh, considered to be one of uh, the dominant uh, creative forces of the 20th century. And uh, he's going to be exhibiting a painting called The Joy of Life in 1906. Uh, traditional subject matter, it's going to be some type of a pastoral scene with people uh, engaging in all sorts of idyllic activities of the sort that you might see uh, maybe on a Roman wall painting or on a Greek urn or something like that. Uh, but the way that he handles them uh, is going to be quite unique, quite new. New enough that most people uh, did not like it, including and especially uh, Matisse's own teacher, Signac. Signac would have been one of the leading voices of his day, and he himself produced uh, works that were new enough and confusing enough that uh, he was considered, again, a cutting-edge artist. Uh, so you, you'd think that he would be open to the work of his student, Matisse, who's also breaking open new ground as a painter. And Sign Signac says, you know, w without any hesitation, this is terrible art, it's awful, and uh, I don't want to hang it at all in the show. Now, the show's going on in the Independence Gallery, so if you can't get picked up um, by a more established salon than people who aren't represented by an agent or somebody like that, they can kind of form an artist collective and show their art anyway. So uh, the hanging committee, the people who got to choose which of these unsigned painters would uh, go onto the wall, uh, one of them is Signac, uh, but Matisse is also uh, on the hanging committee, and so he gets a pass. He's able to show his painting, which otherwise would have been rejected. Um, but people look at the painting, which, you know, if, if you've seen it on the Internet where I placed it right next to the right, as you can see, uh, the subject matter is traditional, but the 
treatment of the body seems to ignore all anatomical knowledge or considerations. The coloring, I guess you could call the body's painted flesh color, but it really looked more like Pepto-Bismol than anything else. It just doesn't seem to offer all of the rewards that people would have turned in search of uh, when looking at a, at a classical painting. So uh, Signac rejects it, though it does get a pass, does get to be put up in the show. And, um, now Matisse, though it will take time for people to uh, gain a broader appreciation of him, has sort of become one of the bad dudes on the art scene because he's producing something, again, that's so out there for its time. Nobody knows what to think of it. Um, so he, he's established his reputation as like the big daring artist of the day. Uh, who should come along, though, but uh, his buddy, they were friendly rivals, Pablo Picasso. And the next year he's going to produce the painting Les Demoiselles de Avignon, uh, again, treating the uh, human body uh, one of the classical objects to be represented in painting in a way that Matisse finds absolutely outrageous, seems to make a mockery of the uh, classical nude in a way that Matisse finds completely outrageous. Um, he refers to Picasso as a complete hoax and he vows that he's going to you know, expose him as the fraud that he is and sink him. Uh, so, well, how is this possible? If Matisse is so wild and daring, you'd think that he would like this innovative painting of Picasso's, uh, but no, he turns out to hate it, and then along comes Picasso, who is now con considered like the, the bad dog on the block, and uh, sure enough, Marcel Duchamp comes along and produces his own painting, which in turn shocks Picasso. So um, what Steinberg is going to argue is this outrage that uh, is supposed to be, or this complete incomprehension, which is supposed to be uh, something which belongs only to the public, and that a key number of elite individuals are completely immune from, that's just not true at all. The public, for him, does not refer to any specific group of people, but it refers to the attitude that one adopts or the state of bewilderment or the feeling of betrayal into which one is thrown automatically when a new work of art comes along that you can't comprehend. And uh, he says this, again, it's not any specific group of people. Why? Because those people who seem to feel this plight of the public, and it can take a number of, it can manifest itself in a number of ways, as uh, anger, as betrayal, as confusion, as even, even as, as boredom. Uh, the, the plight of the public can manifest itself in many ways, but the people who seem to feel this most powerfully are not going to be the non-artists and the people who don't care, but it's actually the people who do care the most who are going to be most eager to denounce any type of new style because it seems to take their own uh, advancement and render them obsolete and, and worthless. So Steinberg's point, and he's getting this from uh, reading important anthropologists, one of them by the name of Marcel Mauss, is that the, the public is not a set of people. It's a role into which one gets thrown when they are triggered by encountering the latest outrageous form of art. So uh, to be in it or to be out of it, to be uh, amongst the leading edge cultural figures and to be amongst the uncomprehending public. Those are just two possible roles and bodies are shifting in and out of them all the time, though those people should 
sound a little bit to one of my courses, like a figure known as the magician. Uh, these individuals are shifting from role to role to role more powerfully and more suddenly than everybody else, but nobody is exempt. So the public, as far as uh, Steinberg is concerned, can and must be taken seriously because we are all, as a society, involved in the process of determining what is good, what is lasting, and why it's lasting. It's not just some elite crew of the arbiters of taste and everybody else just has to take their word for it, but the entire society, including the most advanced figures, are um, constantly feeling this shock of discomfort, bewilderment, anger, or boredom. He says some people will always feel it, but all people will feel it at least sometimes. And again, those who feel it most powerfully are going to be the cutting-edge artists themselves. Now, in Steinberg's own day, or I should say in the decade or so before Steinberg is writing, so this would be in the 1940s and 50s, Steinberg's writing this in 1962, uh, in the 40s and 50s, the leading style of art, the, the hippest, rowdiest uh, kind of painting was known as abstract expressionist. There's a number of people who are famous for producing this type of work. The most famous, and considered the most influential American artist of the 20th century, is Jackson Pollock. You will probably have seen his paintings at one time or another, even if you didn't know who made them, but they're the big, drippy, splashy things. Uh, take up huge uh, sections of wall in major museums, and these are considered some of the most important artworks of the uh, last hundred and something years. So, uh, but again, the idea when these paintings were being made is that, and I'll quote Steinberg here, the raw violence and immediate action which produced these pictures put them beyond the pale of art appreciation and rendered them inherently unacceptable. Um, what we find, though, is that over the course of not that many years, uh, these wildest of painters have become domesticated. It took 10 years for people to do it, but what one time was unthinkably ghastly, is now being uh, accepted widely, exhibited widely, and uh, making its way not just into museums, but making its way into magazines. The most notorious instance of this is when Jackson Pollock, the, you know, the craziest, most outrageous wild man of them all, uh, finds his paintings hanging in the Met, but they are used as backdrops against which to pose fashion models who are advertising the latest party frocks and pinafores uh, for Vogue magazine. It, so, so to go from, you know, un, outrageous <laughs> defiance of all acceptable, all accepted conventions of art and painting, to go from that to wallpaper <laughs> used in Vogue magazine in, in a short space of 10 years, uh, that, that was actually enough to uh, destroy Pollock's career. He'd, he'd seen all of, he'd seen everything he needed to see by then, and uh, he frankly didn't live much longer after that because it, it just took him out of the game. But uh, we do seem to have this uh, astonishing capacity to uh, domesticate, to uh, f make ourselves familiar and comfortable with things which only a little while ago would have, well, not would have, but did in fact blow our minds. And so uh, we can say, well, look, if people can assimilate even Jackson Pollock or, or things after him uh, in only 10 years, then uh, obviously this thing's going to go away. Uh, but Steinberg says, no, as a matter of fact, 
uh, each individual artwork which occasions us to be outraged or to feel this plight, that's got a lifespan before it will finally be assimilated. Uh, but every generation going as far back as there has been, uh, we can say either modernism or the term I might use is uh, bohemia. <laughs> Not bad for the first try. Yeah, what's Bohemia? Those people who, starting around in Paris, uh, decided they wanted to reject a polite company, uh, the accepted conventions of mainstream. Uh, emergent middle-class society and live uh, the life of nomads even if they were only nomads in the city like squatting and, and uh, poorly lit and uh, freezing cold basements or attics to live a life dedicated to a set of values that uh, were theirs and theirs alone, creating art for its own sake and, again, re rejecting uh, all the conventions of mainstream society. Uh, so as, as long as people have been modern, rebellious, um, there has always been some... Uh, new artists to come along and provide them with the kind of grit and challenge that uh, they require. So every generation's had an avant-garde. Steinberg will say is actually kind of a form of, of addiction. Uh, it causes us pain, but uh, the term that he uses, which sounds like a bit of an oxymoron, is a thrill of pain. We, we like to be troubled. We like to be disturbed. And we demand that somebody produce this kind of challenging art for us. So, so much do we crave it, and so much do we see it as uh, an index of modernity and our uh, independence of thought and the, the freedom of our society and our culture is that when we look abroad at other countries, and of course what he has in mind is the Soviet Union in the 1950s, this is the height of the Cold War, over there, going back to 1934, uh, the government had an official style in which everybody had to paint and was trained to paint, and if artists did not adopt this official uh, style known as uh, socialist realism or Soviet socialist realism, you could get into a lot of trouble. You were seen as anti-Soviet. And so everybody had to paint inspiring, realistic paintings done in the style of the most skillful painters of the last century, the types of things that you'd see in Parisian salons, um, but the, the content had to be that of the Soviet uh, government. So they would be realistic paintings uh, done with impeccable craftsmanship, uh, but always of workers rolling up their sleeves and marching off to the steel mill or to the shipyards or farmers rolling up their sleeves and heading off to the harvest. Uh, there'd be uh, inspiring doctors uh, hovering over feverish uh, patients. The, the Soviet family would be praised through this artwork in all of the uh, great deeds of Soviet leaders, such as Lenin and Stalin and stuff like that. Uh, this is what we call Soviet kitsch. And this is the type of thing which uh, is, again, dictated to 
sit in the Soviet Union is the only type of art that's available to them. And Steinberg says when we look abroad at this type of society without any uh, challenging, without any rule-breaking art, it seems to us that that society is only half alive. This new art puts us in a state of anxiety, but uh, there's a word for the state we're in when we feel this gripping anxiety where we are confronted by a new object which seems to exist for some purpose which seems to be designed according to some set of rules but we cannot identify what the purpose and what the set of rules is and that's freedom. Freedom isn't the ability simply to kick back, you know, have a few Coronas on the beach and, you know, sit there doing nothing because you're on holiday. Uh, that's not the feeling of freedom. The feeling of freedom is being confronted with an object which makes some type of a demand on you and you have no rule book. There's no set of instructions uh, explaining what the thing is, how it should be used, what you should name it how you should feel about it. That's freedom. And for, for Steinberg, it's this kind of bracing uh, confrontation with the new and the unknown, which is the very essence of freedom. Uh, the day that you stop feeling anxiety, the day that the newest work of comes out and everybody can agree that it's amazing. Everybody can agree that this new film is completely uh, amazing. That's the day that you know I'm not so free because I'm being deprived of the opportunity to actually make my own choices when confronted with new situations. Uh, I'll, I'll say it again. Uh, feeling completely relaxed, completely at ease with no demands being made of you. That's not freedom, that's a kind of mental slavery. Uh, being challenged, being confronted, and being made to choose when there is no specific set of rules telling you how to behave, that's what freedom feels like. And for Steinberg, that's exactly what we need in modern society, and in particular in America. And, and this is what uh, the leading art of the day, as it comes out for the first time, should offer us. The, America needs this kind of art, and it's going to be Steinberg's idea to talk about its relationship to uh, not just, again, the, the elite few, but uh, the demos. Democracy needs to be challenged by new art, and, and, and we're all in this together.